welcome all. We are just going to hold on for a moment or two whilst um, participants join and we'll get started shortly. this webinar. Thank you for joining us for this webinar on developments in photoplethysmography. The webinar is hosted by the Institute of Physics and Engineering in Medicine, or IPEM. Thank you to Catherine, James and the others at IPEM who have made this possible. My thanks too to the Research Centre for Biomedical Engineering at City University of London, from where I'm speaking today. It's a very exciting and appropriate setting as the centre hosts researchers working on all sorts of aspects of photoplethysmography. The webinar has been recorded and will be made available on the IPEM website. A link will be sent to all registered delegates as soon as it's available to view. Today, we have three talks given by Dr. James May, Eliza Mehia Mehia, and James Annable. During their talks, we encourage you to contribute questions using either the Q&A at the bottom of your screen or the chat box. I will then um, read out these questions after each talk in turn. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Dr. James May. James is a lecturer in biomedical engineering at City. University of London. His research interests centre around optical monitoring and electronic instrumentation development. Today, James will be presenting on phantoms for in vitro investigations of PPG, photoplethysmography, and PPG technology development. James, thank you for presenting today. We're very much looking forward to your talk. Hi, everybody. Um, yes, uh, thank you very much, Peter, for the uh, kind invitation. And uh, thank you, obviously, to IPEM for hosting uh, this uh, very interesting series of um, webinars of which I've um, been observing uh, for the last few months. Uh, I was meant to present in the last one, but unfortunately, I was taken out uh, due to unforeseen circumstances. So I'm very happy to come to you uh, today. Um, I'm going to share my screen now, but I will also turn my video off because I've seems to have a bit of a delay issue by next things, but hopefully this will resolve it. Okay. So anyway, uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen of the uh, attendee list. Uh, it's with great delight and honour to speak to you uh, on the subject of phantoms for PPG research. Uh, and for PPG technology development. So on the subject of phantoms for PPG, there is a lot to discuss. And, you know, in the next 15 minutes, uh, I probably will barely touch on, you know, everything that is available uh, in, in the literature and, you know, it also what we do. I mean, any of the one of the experiments that I might actually briefly show you today um, you know, I could probably speak to, you you know, for a good half an hour uh, or more on anyway. And it's not just the experiments that um, we're conducting in our lab, but also, um, I believe, uh, one of the only centres in the world uh, developing um, actual PPG phantom technology uh, for PPG uh, research. So it's uh, very exciting times. So firstly, I would like to establish um, that in clinical research, animal testing, human or otherwise, um, is probably the most preferential environment of choice when it comes to the exploration and validation of, of hypotheses and trial of new medical devices. Unfortunately, it's precisely because of this in vivo nature that it can often be difficult or impractical uh, or even unethical or dangerous 
and to explore some aspects of PPG signal origin or morphology. And this, um, in our view, could actually um, hamper some of the research uh, that we want to undertake. So in addition to this, you know, when in vivo studies can and are carried out, um, challenges will still remain. Um, among them being the, very minute, the variability among subjects uh, and even within the same subjects at different times of the actual PPG signals. Um, large data sets of PPG signals, although they're available, um, some pathologies that we might want to explore, um, those data sets are either a rare, scarce, or you know, totally non-existent. So having a, an in vitro method um, to you know, gather some uh, these types of signals um, will be invaluable to um, signal processing uh, and for the development of new devices. Uh, there's also um, two other issues, and uh, uh, one being the compromised data gathering. Um, I have a um, background in um, clinical trials, and um, you know, often when we were doing our clinical trials, um, it was often um, the case that it would be um, we'd be in surgery uh, or at the bedside in the ICU of patients. And often we would have to place our sensors without too much interference um, to the patient. So we didn't really get long to um, optimize the placement or um, you know, utilize everything that we could. Um, so often you know, data gathering could be compromised. Um, one of the um, examples that springs to mind is um, when we were doing some PPG um, gathering, for example, uh, we wanted to place some of our sensors on some hands and feet. Uh, unfortunately, the um, patient had suffered suffered some uh, very nasty burns, um, which gave us the opportunity to explore um, one of our other sensors designed for um, oesophageal measurements. Um, but the only other um, peripheral measurement we're actually allowed to um, use um, was across the nose. Uh, luckily, we were allowed to get P we could get PPG signals, but um, they were compromised in quality. So you know these kind of things are. Um, you know, always a problem. Uh, and, you know, because of this, the analysis um, can be um, quite challenging. So the main advantages of in vitro modeling in PPG are that the main signal parameters can be altered to suit the study. Um, specific pathologies can be introduced and tested at extreme cases. Physical models of previous in silico studies can also be tested to confirm outcomes or gather new intelligence. And this is really useful when, um, for example, you're doing Monte Carlo analysis uh, and you're only able to um, simulate at most a couple of seconds uh, worth of data in you know, a very large amount of computing time. Instead, we can run a um, in vitro model uh, uh, with the exact same um, physical model parameters as the in silico model, and we're able to actually gather the actual um, the, um, the length of the signal that we originally wanted. And the main other advantage is that nearly any anatomy can be replicated with um, custom properties for the volume and the shape and geometry of the actual um, area of interest. And we can also tailor the optics and the mechanical properties as well, um, you know, within, uh, within, within reason. So medical phantoms, um, for the most part, um, I think most people, um, I would assume on the participant list, are, are in the area of um, medical monitoring. Um, you may be used to the type of uh, phantoms that you see here on the screen. So we have you know, patient simulators, uh, and we also have um, actual um, medical phantoms. And these can be used for two purposes, uh, mainly. These, these are mainly used for um, calibration of equipment, uh, testing um, the competency of our medical professionals, and also doing quality assurance tests of our imaging devices. Uh, these um, are all very valuable and um, worthwhile devices. And there's no um, hospital in the world that can actually function without these things our medical engineers and our medical physicists rely on them. 
Um, but there is the third type of phantom, and you know that is the type of phantom that I would like that I am speaking to you about today. Uh, and those are the phantoms um, which, instead of being used to calibrate equipment, are used instead to look at the actual um, physical parameters of the signals. So the idea is you have a already calibrated um, sensor and you can place it on the phantom and the signals that you gather are um, representative of the actual biology that you're looking at. So um, typically um, in PPG phantoms that we've been developing in our lab, um, there are two main components. Um, there's a pumping component, which is responsible for the um, positile blood flow. Um, I think most people will argue that um, you can't really have a phantom without a positile blood flow. So a really good positile pumping source it, um, is ideal. Um, normally these take on the form of actual um, blood pumps, um, positile with a linear actuator, or they can be uh, peristaltic um, blood pumps um, for smaller volumes. And then the second part to the phantom, um, really the main second part, because there is a third part here in the middle, uh, is the actual physical um, tissue vessel uh, simulant uh, that you can see here. So here's a 3D representation of um, some small vessels that we were um, testing in our lab um, with um, some small venous reservoirs. And this is the actual um, physical um, uh, device that we made. And as I said, there's a third part. We, all, uh, we have a, um, a, a arterial and venous return flow with um, peripheral and um, venous uh, clamping to um, replicate the um, resistance seen in the body. And we can also do replications of um, large vessels in the, in the body. Um, so this experiment was actually set up to um, help validate some in silico modeling we had done, um, where we're looking at different penetration depths and um, separation distances between the um, light source and the detector. And again, we have, um, this is the main actual tissue vessel simulant. Um, this is using um, just standard commercial vessels, but it was made with a, um, a silicon uh, to a formulation where we could actually tailor the, um, the actual hardness to be the same as um, physical tissue. And then we had a, a blood pump and a, and a vessel network as well to help replicate um, that part of it as well. Another area um, that we um, look at is also um, looking to see if we can create um, uh, anatomy models that are very highly representative um, of the actual geometry. So here we see a head phantom, um, and this is um, some doing some intracranial pressure monitoring. Uh, and obviously we have a whole setup here. So we have another blood pump running. We have a, a, a blood vessel network with um, filtration and oxygenation going on. And we have independent control of intracranial pressure. Um, another um, thing that we like to look at and is always um, maybe a concern for the people who are developing wearable devices um, is in how, um, especially those who are, which are wrist-based, you know, for like watch devices, um, is, you know, how does the contact pressure actually um, um, alter the PPG signal? Uh, and so, you know, we, we've been able to set up in our lab a very reliable and um, steady method um, to replicate um, the different contact pressure that you see on top of um, human tissue. And we're able to you know, measure that force uh, and see um, the actual normalized PPG uh, level amplitude um, uh, change as we're um, changing the, uh, the, the, the pressure on top of the, uh, the actual vessel. So, you know, in our hypothesis, you know, it should be that you know, as you're increasing the, um, the pressure, you're also increasing the penetration depth into the tissue. So therefore, you should see a, an increased amplitude gain on the PBG signal, uh, only up to a certain point, because then you start to occlude the vessel and your amplitude should then begin to fall. Uh, that was our hypothesis, and obviously well, we've been able to replicate that here. 
So of course, the actual fabrication of these um, tissue vessel phantoms um, is uh, very fascinating because um, you can't just grab any you know, tubing and um, silicon off the shelf uh, and, and say that that's it. You know, the human body, um, the anatomy of the animal is, um, is very different to the commercial materials you see. Um, you know, blood has um, viscoelastic properties, as does the, the vessels and the tissues, um, which encompass is the blood that flows through uh, the blood that flows through them. So um, in our lab, um, uh, we realized this very early on. Um, and whilst it was very easy to make um, uh, tissues with varying hardnesses and stiffnesses, it has been quite a challenge um, to replicate um, uh, vessels with the correct geometries and also with the correct uh, elasticities. So we've um, begun doing a lot of work now in um, some custom fabrication techniques. And we've been able to actually now um, develop vessels um, down to about 1.4 millimeters with an inner diameter, but only with a wall thickness of 60 micrometers, um, which is incomparable to the actual human anatomy uh, that we see. And for comparison, the nearest commercial grade vessel um, uh, was a 0.7 millimeter in a diameter with a 350 micron wall thickness. Um, so we have uh, you know, made um, good headway in our vessel replication. And then testing the elasticity or the circumferential force on those vessels um, was, was another challenge. Um, I think um, anybody in material testing can um, contend that the actual um, testing of such small intricate um, materials is very difficult. Um, so we've been able to actually um, produce a new method where actually after the vessels have been constructed, um, we can actually test the, um, the circumferential force in, in our vessels using a, a custom pressure setup like, like the one you see here. And this is being um, presented next week at the um, IEEE uh, conference in medical and uh, biology uh, in Glasgow. So just uh, kind of a, a summary over what, you know, PPG phantom development is and what's happening is that, you know, we see in vitro um, as a complementary to all other trial methods. But importantly, you know, in vitro research, you know, helps rapid development and deployment of wearable technologies by offering a large portion of the in vivo trialing to a, to a lab bench. You know, we can replace a lot of the in vivo trialing um, quite easily. And because of that, you know, the in vitro experiments, they won't completely replace in vivo user trials, but instead um, they will improve the design methodology of those trials by optimizing the sensor setup. And the in silico work um, can be partially validated also uh, without the need for in vivo work and new models can be quickly developed to test new hypotheses in silico as well. And you know, just a little bit on the, um, the material side of it as well. Um, we've found, you know, through some trial and error in our lab, that our PDMS materials are highly configurable, and they can, you know, in terms of their optics, their mechanics, their geometry, their volume, and they can be scaled up or down to nearly any anatomy of interest. And silicon has um, a very um, interesting um, way that it behaves, um, so it can actually be combined with. Um, uh, other materials with silicon in them. So plastics um, and crystalline structures such as quartz and glass um, can also be incorporated in to change their properties as well. And because um, the in vitro model is um, a, you know, a standalone thing and you can just keep using it, we, we found it they've been reliable and robust and we can repeat our experiments many, many times. Uh, and because of this, um, you know, generating new data sets uh, of signals uh, ready for advanced signal processing development um, uh, is, is, you know, on the horizon. So thank you very much uh, for listening to me uh, chat on about in vitro PPG work. Um, sorry I couldn't go into like really the fine details. I think I'll probably be speaking for a couple of hours 
if I did that, but I welcome any questions now. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, James. Uh, fascinating talk, and I think lots of opportunities for this to play a crucial role in PPG yes. research. Um, to start with, we have a question from Haipeng at Coventry University. He asks, um, the PPG waveform is sensitive to many factors. And indeed, for example, you showed us how the impact of contact pressure yeah. can affect the amplitude. And um, therefore, have you designed a standard protocol that you could use to model PPG waveforms? Um, so there are two main methods to actually um, model the PPG waveform itself without the anatomy. Um, there's obviously the um, in silico um, simulation me methods that I think, Peter, you're familiar with. Um, and also, um, you know, in the in vitro environment, um, what we tend to do is we drive our pumps with a sinusoidal or a, a, a bell uh, pulse. And um, because of the uh, vessel networks that you saw uh, in my slides, I'll just go back to one for you just to show you, for these vessel networks, these create um, reflections in, in, uh, and in, in, uh, uh, different um, morphologies within the signal um, to replicate the actual um, PPG morphology. Um, with regards to the um, question that Haipeng had um, about you know, um, age and you know, whether or not we can change those parameters, um, yes, we can do that. Um, the, um, the pumps, uh, you know, they, they don't just get driven by sinusoidal pumps, we can actually drive them with um, custom signals as well. So if you can imagine um, a scenario where we have a very small setup, um, we can um, actually drive the um, simulant um, with any type of waveform that we want. Thank you. And one further question from Haipeng. Um, so theoretically, in the microcirculation, the PPG waveform is approximately an integration of um, flow rate, velocity, perhaps volume. Yeah. Um, have you observed a relationship between the PPG waveform and perhaps flow velocity in the large arteries? Um, we, at the moment um, in, in our work, the, the flow velocity um, is, is primarily only measured at the outlet of the pumps. Um, we haven't measured the um, the flow velocities in the very tight, the very small vessels. Um, it's very difficult to do that. Um, flow meters um, don't go down to that kind of size, and using Doppler ultrasound um, is quite challenging at the moment. Um, we need to find um, it can be done, and we have done it, um, but it, it remains it remains a challenge. But we do see um, that the um, outlet flow does change on some of our systems compared um, when we change the actual simulants. Even though we set it to a set rate, it won't ever get to that rate if we have certain phantom set up, um, which would then suggest to us that a, you know we um, we there is something going on there. Um, primarily, you know, um, I'm, my background is in electronic engineering and instrumentation, and I model most of the um, networks that I set up um, uh, as I would um, setting up a, a resistor network. So, you know, I substitute um, current for flow and a voltage for pressure, for example. Uh, and, you know, that does me quite well um, for the most part, for the very simple, uh, for the most simple models. Uh, but when you start getting to the more complex ones, um, it, it is a challenge at the moment. And one very brief final question, if we may. Um, yeah. Have you faced any challenges in terms of blood turbulence with the Phantom? Uh, yeah, so um, you, we, we have to be very careful with um, um, turbulent flow. One of my colleagues in um, Estonia is um, looking at exactly these method, uh, exactly these problems. Um, so we have two methods to look at turbulent flow. 
Um, we've actually got a steady state flow pump as well. So we're not looking at pulsatile signals. So we're looking at the high frequency components and uh, calculating Reynolds number and seeing how it actually compares to the actual Reynolds number of the um, turbulent flow that we might expect. Um, but to deal with it in our actual system, it's just about careful design. So um, we don't have any sharp T junctions on the outflow path, for example, and we have large reservoirs um, going on the Venus return. Brilliant. Well, it's been uh, fascinating to gain an insight into the amount of detail that you go into in designing this setup, whether it's avoiding T junctions or what it might be. So, James, may I thank you once again for a fascinating talk. No worries, thank you, Peter. Uh, welcome, Eliza Mehia Mehia. Um, Eliza is nearing the end of her PhD here at City University of London. And in her research, she's investigated algorithms in the field of pulse rate variability. Indeed, she's published an excellent review paper on the topic, which I'll put in the chat. Today, she'll be presenting on photoplephysmography-based pulse rate variability, standardization of the technique using simulated signals. Eliza, thank you for speaking to us today. We're looking forward to your talk. Thank you, Pete, and thank you for the introduction. Hey, I'm going to share my screen now. So you can... Okay, so as Pete mentioned, my name is Elisa Mejia. I am currently finishing my PhD here in City University of London, I'm originally from Medellin, Colombia. And I'm going to be talking about a little bit of my work during my PhD, specifically in my work in standardization of pulse reliability using simulated TPG signals. So first of all, a little bit about what pulse reliability is. So we have a cardiovascular system in which we have the heart and, and our blood vessels. And this cardiovascular system, it's very important to, to take the blood all around our body, but it's mainly controlled by the autonomic nervous system, which has a parasympathetic and a sympathetic uh, branch. And it's all the time trying to change the blood pressure, the heart rate, and the, the cardiac output to make sure that our body is receiving like everything that we need at any given time. So one of the main things that uh, our autonomic nervous system is doing is changing our heart rate. So our heart rate, it remains usually in a, in a like mean point, but it varies around that average. And that is called heart rate variability. It basically describes uh, the changes of the duration of the cardiac cycles in time. And it reflects uh, these changes uh, as, as a function of the cardio, cardiovascular control executed by the sympathetic and the, the parasympathetic nervous system. Uh, Right now, there's a lot of attention on, on HRV, on heart rate variability, but it is uh, currently restricted in clinical uh, scenarios. It is based on extracting the cardiac cycles from the electrocardiogram, and that is one of its main issues because uh, acquiring the electrocardiogram in a non-intrusive way, it's uh, particularly hard. So recently, in the last 30 years, a lot of research has been focused on extracting the information of heart rate variability from pulsatile signals, such as the, uh, as the PPG. So the PPG, as uh, James explained, it is a simple, a low cost, a non-invasive, and an optical uh, measurement technique that is going to give us information of blood volume changes. So it basically changes with cardiac cycle as well. That's why people are starting to use this to extract pulse rate variability that is the, like the changes in pulse, rate, in pulse rate through time. As they would do with, with DCG, they detect the peaks and they measure the cardiac cycles and they try to estimate those indices from PRV instead of HRV. However, also they originate from similar uh, processes. It's, it has been shown that pulse reliability and, and heart reliability are not exactly the same. There's, they, they follow similar trends, but there are some issues that are different in them. So there are two big theories. One of them that PRV and HRV are different because of physiological changes, such as changes in blood pressure. And another like big group of uh, like studies have been focusing on how technical factors may be affecting PRV in a way different to HRV. So today I'm going to talk mainly about this, but like we've 
like don't work in both sides, but I'm going to, to focus on, on how these technical aspects are changing PRB. Uh, to do this, like uh, the aim is to determine the most adequate parameters for PRB assessment from PPG signal. But uh, it is a little bit difficult because there is no standard for PRB assessment. You can find in the literature something that says you should follow this and like you, you are going to get the reliable PRB information. So uh, it makes it very difficult to compare and validate re the results from different studies. So our approach is to have simulated PPG signals and simulated PRV information that can give us a big database to determine these parameters. And this is not only a, a good advantage because we are going to have a large database, but also because we are going to use this simulated PRV information as our gold standard. Usually in the literature, you go and find that they are trying to understand how these technical aspects are changing PRV, but they compare it to HRV. And what if PRV and HRV are not exactly the same, again, because of the physiological changes, then it is not entirely appropriate to compare PRV and HRV. So using simulated PPG and simulated PRV, we can have big databases and a gold standard that is our simulated PRV. With this in mind, uh, we developed like six experiments. I'm going to go very fast through them uh, to try to determine some of these parameters. So we focus on the fiducial point detection from the PPG signal, the sampling rate from the PPG signal, how long the signal needs to be, how to execute the spectral analysis to obtain frequency domain information from pulse reliability, how should we manage outliers, and how should we process the PPG signal to obtain a reliable PRV uh, trend. The simulation framework is a modified version of the model proposed by Tang et al. Uh, and it is based on a, each cardiac cycle is simulated as a summation of two Gaussian functions. So we have different like qualities of these of these cardiac cycles in our uh, like area of interest. We have an excellent cardiac cycle and an acceptable cardiac cycle. So we have we have a way to simulate to simulate each cardiac cycle, and then we have a, a function a summation of sinusoidal uh, waves that are going to give us the information of pulse reliability. And this uh, uh, simulation of PRV depends on plausible uh, physiological values. So we have our cardiac cycles and we have the PRV information. If we mix them together, we have a PPG signal of any length and we have a, like any number of signals that we need. Also in our framework, we are able to include noise. So at the moment, the framework has respiratory noise based on wandering, electromagnetic noise and movement artifacts. And you can generate any combination of these, of these noises. So we have a way to generate any length of signals with any like particular PRV information with two different qualities and with 15 combinations of noise. With this in mind, we did, as I said, we did uh, six experiments. These experiments were sequential, so each of like the results from from the previous experiment were were used for the next experiment. The first experiment uh, was to uh, determine which detection method and fiducial point gives us the most reliable PRV information. For this, we use 125 PPG signals uh, generated with the simulation framework. For the second experiment, we were focusing on how the sampling rate affected uh, PRV. For the third one, we try to understand how using different spectral analysis techniques where it's going to affect our PRV information. The fourth one was uh, all about how long the PPG signal needs to be. And this is very important because usually uh, they, they ask to have five minutes of, of signal to acquire the PRV information, at least five minutes. So let, what happens if we need shorter times for real-time assessment of, of PRV? So that's what we are trying to understand here. The fifth experiment was to understand what we need to do to manage outliers after we have detected all the intermediate intervals. And the sixth, and uh, the last one, uh, it's how noise affects our PRV and how should we process the PPG signal to obtain reliable PRV information. So I'm going to go super fast through these results. And sorry if I'm talking very fast, it's only 15 minutes. Uh, for the first experiment, we had five uh, algorithms. 
uh, all of them are described in the literature. And we have nine fiducial points, as you can see in the figure. With all of these, we extracted the PRB and, and obtained time domain and point carrier plot indices. And the differences between these and those, those indices extracted from the gold standard simulated PRB information, uh, we compared them using factorial analysis. At the end, we found that the, the algorithm D2 max had the best performance for PRB analysis, but the linear and, um, and a hard pie were very close to. Whereas uh, for the fiducial point, the best uh, results were obtained using the A point that's detected from the secondary of the derivative of the PPG signal, but the tangent intersection and the onset points were also relatively good for PRB assessment. Then uh, we focus on the sampling rate. So we generated a, a lot of PPG signals with different sampling rates. And we found that using sampling rates below 128 Hz didn't allow allowed us to have a reliable PRV information from the PPGs. So when you are using PR, when you are extracting PRV information, you need to have at least 128 Hz of sampling rate for the PPG or consider interpolating the signal. For the spectral analysis, uh, we couldn't find anything in the literature in which people were trying to, to find out which is the best way to extract frequency domain indices from, the, from, from HRV or from PRV. And it is quite important because most of the analysis based on HRV and PRV are, are trying to, to, to understand this information, especially the low frequency and the high frequency bands of the, of, of the spectra. So, we uh, extracted the, the intermediate intervals from the simulated PPG, PPG signals and obtained the spectral analysis from this using classical techniques, model-based methods, and the Lombus calculus algorithm. Then for each of these, we did a factorial analysis and understood which was the best combination of parameters for each of the techniques, then compared all of them together using a Kruskal Wallis and obtained that the best options for PRV analysis would be to use the FFT or to use the PMUSIC with a specific parameters for all of them. The fourth experiment that we developed was uh, trying to understand how long the PPG signal needs to be to have reliable PRV information. And we found that uh, if the PPG signals are lower than 120 seconds, they tend to be, there tend to be uh, larger differences between the gold standard and the extracted indices. But after 300 seconds, that's the five minutes, all of them are very stable. So try to try to use a, between 120 seconds and, a 300, and 300 seconds to, us, to obtain that PRB information from the PPG. The fifth experiment uh, was outlier management in which after like detecting the intermediate intervals, we wanted to know how should we manage outliers here. So we use different identification methods and different correction methods. And we found that PNM50 uh, time domain index was extremely affected by managing these outliers. So uh, care should be taken with this index. But in general, the correction method did not have any statistic, uh, statistically significant uh, difference. And usually there's no need to apply any additional outlier management after the intervening intervals were detected using appropriate uh, uh, algorithms. And finally, uh, we have the noise management experiment in which we have 15 different types of noise, a, a combination of the noises that I already mentioned. And we filtered all these signals using finite impulse response and infinite impulse response filters with different cutoff frequencies. We found, uh, oh, well, in, the, in the figure you can see a, a, an example of the, of the signals that we can generate with different types of noise. And we found that a, this is actually very important for PRV analysis and something that very few people have, like, have started noticing that we need to uh, use appropriate preprocessing techniques for PRV analysis. The most affected index again was the PNM50. And, and usually uh, we can see that the best filters that we can use are the elliptic uh, infinite impulse response filter or the equitable or parks McClellan FIR filter. Usually having lower cutoff frequencies gave us better results, whereas uh, the high cutoff frequency didn't have a lot of impact 
except for when movement artifact was involved, which is most of the time. So uh, the, better, the better results in these cases was with eight hertz as high cutoff frequency. So as a conclusion, uh, a reminder, the aim of this experiment was to determine the most adequate parameters for PRB assessment from PPG signals. We found that the better performance was obtained when signals were longer than 130 seconds and had sampling rates above 256, above or equal to 256 seconds. Uh, the signal should be filtered using lower low cutoff frequencies, an elliptic equiripple or Parks McClellan filters. That depends on the noise. So it's very important to understand what kind of noise you have in your signal. Also, the PRV trends were more reliable when detected using the D2 max and the A fiducial point uh, algorithm and fiducial points. Uh, there was no need to uh, do any additional layer management. And the spectral analysis should be performed using FFT or P music. This is the first approach to establish guidelines for PRB assessment from PPG signals. And our view is to uh, continue working on this. So there is like a, a standardization of the PPG and the PRV uh, application specifically. It is very important that we start thinking about how to standardize this signal, how to make sure that uh, we can compare the results from one from our study to the other one to give it not only to PRV, but to PPG a little bit more reliability. So future work, uh, first of all, we need to validate, validate these results using real data. However, here we have one question. So we are using now PPG, uh, P the, the gold standard PRV, but if we go to real data, what are we going to use? Should we use HRV or what do we need to use? Also, there's a room, room for improvement in, in the simulation framework, especially in the PRV model. And we could like uh, think about different alternatives to how to simulate that PRV information. And there are a bunch of aspects that we need to consider to continue working on this standardization of PRV and PPG. A, there are some related publications to this. Some of these are currently under review, so hopefully they are published soon, but please do not doubt and contact me if you have any questions. So thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Elisa. Um, I would just like to echo a few of the comments in the chat, which go, great work, good work. This is very impressive work. Congratulations, amazing work. And <laughs> I would add mine to that. That was a fantastic talk and a very impressive body of work. So congratulations. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you but I hope you have questions too. <laughs> and perhaps, uh, so I will answer the question about Pulse Analyze in the chat. Um, perhaps I could ask a question because I think you've addressed high pings about the filtering in your uh, talk there. My question is, so now that you have established under what conditions you should assess pulse rate variability, when do you think we can measure it? So for instance, you might say to me, well, you can only measure it if someone's lying down for at least five minutes at rest and then you have a good signal for your 200 seconds. Or you might say, well, actually, as long as they're sitting down watching TV, then although your wearable only samples at 100 hertz, we can interpolate and maybe we can get a measurement then. Well, the idea would be to be able to, to measure it any time. So that's, that's the whole point in using PPG instead of ECG, like having the, 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 the signal most of the time so we can really understand how real life uh, scenarios are affecting our autonomic control. So yeah, that would be my, my ideal, but of course, this is just the first step for this. And if you notice, like the, we left the filtering part of it as the last experiment. So now the next path should be, okay, now we know how to filter it. So what happens with the rest of the, of, of the parameters if we start with noisy signals? So that would help a lot to understand how should we like process the PPG signal to obtain PRB information from it. And uh, yeah, like in any, in any scenario. So uh, yeah. Well, my thanks once again for a fantastic talk. Thank you, Elisa. Thank you, Pete. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce our next speaker, 
James Annable, a DPhil student at the University of Oxford, who is aiming to create new predictive methods that can assist physicians practicing in low resource healthcare environments. Today, James will present on attention methods for longer TPG sequences. James, thank you very much for speaking today. We're looking forward to your talk. Thanks so much for that introduction. And thanks also to our, our past speakers for their very interesting work on improving the quality of the PPG data that ends up being collected. So um, hopefully everyone can see my screen now. <clears throat> and so as, as Peter said, I'll be talking about attention methods for long PPG sequences, essentially leveraging AI methods to consider more data, more context um, within the constraints of computational resources and deployed systems. So starting very straightforwardly at a very high level, um, the question as to why is PPG useful for digital health, um, it's very inexpensive and easy to collect. So we can get a lot of very rich information on breathing and heart rate over time, you know, in a large PPG data set relatively easily and fluctuations and information within that large PPG data set can serve as essentially digital biomarkers that lay the groundwork for effective predictive systems using machine learning. So with these data sets that we're able to collect in clinical settings and from at-home monitoring systems, we can train robust machine learning models for diagnostics, prognostics, and other clinical tasks. These models can be deployed for instant results. And end to end, we hopefully would have an inexpensive, effective, lightweight system for precision health that can be useful anywhere, but especially in lower resource settings. So in the past, we've already seen successful projects using PPG data to diagnose um, sepsis, tetanus, COVID-19, and even dementia and other neurological disorders. However, we've also observed that many studies use very short sequences of PPG waveforms for training machine learning models. So we're taking a little bit, for example, the dementia study used three minutes and using that small window of context to attempt to complete some sort of task, even though with a wearable device, it, it's realistic to capture hours or even days worth of data. So, and that, that kind of leads into the problem. So of course there's, you know, a lot of information even in a single day's worth of data collection and several seconds or several minutes may not be enough time to capture the information that we need to complete the task, especially for more complex tasks, perhaps laying at the interface of lab tests and PPG and understanding how those two modalities can interact and how they can be swapped out. And here environment, environmental factors or other variables may include um, the biomarkers we need, so patients' interactions with their surroundings, interactions with treatments and other medications may trigger the significant events that we need to complete a task, especially in a chaotic context like the ICU. And the other question we have, and this is well characterized in language AI, is, you know, the biomarkers may not be represented as singular events, but rather um, captured in the variance of the sequence over time. So things happening in previous states, you know, defining the significance of something that's going on in the current state. So essentially intra-patient or intra-sample variance being the method for which we need to determine the biomarkers in PPG data. And with that, of course, you know, the, the answer would be having a much longer sequence, like we would leverage a paragraph rather than a sentence in language AI, but that's really a challenge um, for at least the cutting edge methods that we need to complete complex tasks, because oftentimes the PPG waveforms are converted into spectrograms, which are 2D matrices that contain frequency information about a signal over time. And those spectrograms are used as inputs to the AI models. And depending on the parameters used, a spectrogram for five seconds of PPG data can be 60,000 data points. So now if we have a 12 hour sequence, obviously computationally, that's an extremely intensive and challenging task to try and understand understand at a high at a very nuanced way what's going on in that sequence and here's just an example of what that matrix looked like right before the AI model would see it we can see we have frequency information on the y-axis and then time of course on the x-axis so the key research question that we're looking at is you know can we develop new AI methods specifically for PPG sequence to understand and capture intrapatient variants and longer sequences without breaking the bank on computational resources and GPUs and without losing key information during dimensionality reduction which is currently how long sequences are often handled in the context of AI for PPG research 
So some new directions that we're going in, of course, PPG sequences are tend to be much longer than sentences in terms of the amount of data points that we have in the sequence. So a lot of the language AI techniques that have been so successful in capturing that longitudinal context may not apply here. There's also, unlike text, a lot of data to ignore. So we often find long periods of steady state data within PPG sequences that don't have significant clinical events. So right now, given the current state of AI, large architectural advancements seem very unlikely. The state-of-the-art algorithms in terms of how they're designed are very difficult to beat on just about any task involving time series data. But we've identified two main areas for inno innovation that we feel can really improve how PPG data is analyzed, particularly in a longer or extended form. So the first of which is you know, how we calculate attention, which I'll talk about in a second, or essentially how we pick the important parts of the sequence. And second, our learning objective. So essentially how we're encoding information into our algorithms and how we pick the information that will then be used in a clinical setting to complete the task. So I'll start with first the attention methods, which again, is just kind of a way of teaching a model where in a sequence it should pay attention or you know, what exactly it should be looking at. And in recent years, attention methods via the transformer have transformed natural language processing or AI for language. And we've seen you know, from Google and Facebook and other, other leaders in that field, incredible improvements on the ability of AI models to take in lengthy sequences of text and extract relevant information from that or answer a question. And there, these attention methods are extremely useful because they can identify which parts of the sequence have you know, an important relationship to the current element. So as an example here, if we're trying to learn information or capture relevant context on this sentence, our model would essentially learn over time that the relationship between eating and apple is a key relationship in the sentence and the relationship between green and apple is a key relationship in the sentence because green describes apple, but there's the relationship between eating and green is less important because those two words really have no meaning relative to each other. And that's the foundation of, of attention right there is that essentially we're learning, you know, these two elements have an important relationship, these two don't. And we can use that information to represent or understand the sequence as a whole. So right now for anything that's essentially a 2D spatial temporal matrix, in most cases images, the best AI model that's currently on the market, if you will, is called the vision transformer. And vision transformers use attention, like we can see here, to learn from like large image data sets or data sets containing large matrices, repre learn representations of those that are much lower dimensions, and then use those representations for tasks such as classification. Unfortunately, even a model as robust as the vision transformer, and truly it's been exciting what we've been able to do with other shorter, smaller matrices, these are still unable to handle very large, you know, unreduced input matrices like extended PPG sequences. So even with these cutting edge attention models, we're still at a bit of a loss, you know, on how to handle these extended sequences that we need to capture that intrapatient variant variance or understand or identify those more complex biomarkers in the sequence. So one of the areas where we're focusing our attention is on modifying the vision transformer so that we can leverage the, the power and effectiveness of that model towards this particular problem. And we will simply, rather than changing the structural um, breakdown of the VIT, we'll modify it so that the attention itself is done differently. And within the matrix or within the sequence, our vision transformer model will consider only a subset of the relationships between regions. In our past example, essentially, we would consider the relationship of every word with every other word. But here, we're only going to uh, take a subset of those relationships and use those to represent the entire sequence. And what I'll show with an image in just a second is that doing it this way, the model will learn information indirectly on the entire matrix. So here, if we have the sentence, I am now going to sleep, we don't need to check the relationship between every pair of words in this entire sentence. It makes sense, it's intuitive that if we understand the relationship between am and now and am and going and am and sleep and sleep and two, we'll have enough information to understand what's important about that sentence if we needed to make a prediction. We don't necessarily need to connect every single one of these dots to capture the relevant context that's needed for a successful predictive model. So that brings us to what we've 
kind of put together where we're using a mix of global and random attention to optimize performance on longer sequences and larger matrices. So we've seen this work done in language and now we've changed it up a little bit to work with um, computer vision or image processing or matrix processing. And so for some regions of our matrix, we'll consider the relationship with all of the other parts. So we'll perform global attention for some specified regions of the matrix. And for the other regions, we'll consider the relationship with only some of the other parts like we see here. So by, by balancing between global and random attention, we can learn a lot of the context we need to have a predictive model while removing you know, a lot of the computational work that the model has to do on a very, very long sequence. And will we also take this a step further by using other active optimization strategies to choose which relationships are considered by our model? So instead of randomly picking 40% of the relationships and using those to capture enough context, we can train our model to select 10% of the very best ones and use that to further, you know, to, to hold for a stable performance while optimizing the computational resources used. So we start with this mixture of considering all the relationships for some of the segments, and then for some of them only considering a subset of those relationships, which reduces the amount of work that our model has to do. And then we can take that a step further by using other strategies, such as reinforcement learning, for example, to reduce even further the number of relationships we need to consider by only picking the best ones or only picking the most important segments for global attention and using the rest for random attention in one example. So now I move to learning objectives. So I talked a little bit about attention and you know, how we're working on developing new attention mechanisms for PPG data. And now I'll talk a little bit about how we're teaching models to represent data. So a deep learning model or a deep learning algorithm takes data as input and it creates some sort of representation, but we need a way to evaluate those models or train those models to create the right sorts of representations for the task that we wanna do. So one very popular and emerging learning objective or, or teaching tool for our AI models is called contrastive learning. And here the model is essentially generating similar representations of similar things and very different representations of different things, which is, sounds very simple, but in the process, it's actually been shown that this is a very effective way of learning key distinguishing information. So obviously if the model is able to distinguished one data point from other data points, it's learned something interesting or unique about that data point that's important enough to distinguish it from everything else. So here's just an example of contrastive learning and it's a very, very simple form. So essentially, you know, we might consider this original image of a monkey and some augmented version of that to be the same. And the model has to identify key features between the two images, despite the rotations or the, the changes in color that would represent what a monkey is. And it would be forced to make that similar and it would be penalized if it were unable to make it similar. Whereas between the monkey and the tiger, we would want to accentuate the differences and make those dissimilar, thereby you know, learning how to identify very robust features of what a monkey looks like while being able to distinguish the monkey from all other types of data. So for our pipeline, for our, our purposes with these extended PPG sequences, we're going to modify traditional contrastive learning objectives and make them just a bit more flexible. So essentially what we'll, we'll do is we'll learn long-term relationships from ex an extremely long sequence and potentially an infinitely long sequence, hypothetically, two regions at a time. So we'll only ever need two regions at a time to be able to do this. And over the course of training, our model will be able to learn how to capture those long-term dependencies while only needing to simultaneously handle two at a time, which will reduce the computational burden and increase the efficiency. So the way we've done this is we've said essentially that the neighboring regions of the sequence are considered positive pairs with similar representations, and the very distant regions are considered negative pairs where we want to learn key differences. And our assumption here is that each region of the sequence contains sufficient local context such that we don't need to accentuate its difference with the neighboring regions. What we really want to understand is what happened in the more distant past, key events that may have a direct effect on what's going on right now. It's essentially adding memory into our AI models without actually having to give it the full sequence all at once for it to memorize. 
And our approach here is flexible in that the positivity or negativity of the pair is determined by the distance, not by a discrete label. So here we say, you know, these are positive pairs because they're both of monkeys, and these are negative pairs because we've got a monkey and a tiger. Whereas here we say the further we get away from the current state, the more negative the pair is, and the more we need to learn those key differences in hopes to capture those long term dependencies while also identifying a robust representation of the local state. And those are the methods that we've designed and in early tests have shown that leveraging these longer sequence with effective methods have improved results on basic classification and diagnostic tasks like predicting the positivity and negativity of COVID-19. And we're expand, expanding that into a much more detailed study as a collaboration with the Oxford University Clinical Research Unit in Ho Chi Minh City, Vietnam. And our aim here is to understand the role of wearable sensors in digital technology, namely AI models in ICU settings. And to do that, we've got access to hundreds of infectious disease patients at the Hospital for Tropical Diseases in Ho Chi Minh City. So I guess the center point of this study is over, there are over 100 patients with COVID-19 that we've gotten access to. We have detailed longitudinal EHR, apologies for the typo. So we've essentially got, you know, medication outcomes, comorbidities, complications, lab test results over the course of two weeks, as well as 10 to 12 hours on average of PPG data per patient. So obviously these are much, much longer sequences than our AI models have previously been able to handle. And we're performing a very in-depth study to benchmark and better understand the impact of sequence lengths on AI models trained with PPG and the effect of new attention mechanisms and new learning objectives on AI models trained with PPG data for clinical purposes. Our future work in this area, of course, we really want to make it as available as possible, this information on how to optimize sequence length and how to optimize learning so that PPG can be most effective, effectively leveraged in a digital technology context and in a, a monitoring context. Well, we're also planning to release our data set and our new AI methods as a package so that for future studies involving lengthy sequences, we can you know, make these, these effective methods as available as possible. And finally, transitioning some of these methods into real-time AI systems for live 24-7 PPG monitoring um, in the ICU setting or in cases of, of at-home monitoring as well. So a lot of this will be coming in the, the next days, weeks, and months. So some of these things are not available yet, but they soon will be. But if you have any questions or would like to discuss any of this work further, please feel free to send me an email and I'll be happy to go through it in greater detail. And Peter, thank you once again for the opportunity to speak here. Thank you, James, for a fascinating talk and for uh, giving us an insight into this emerging area and your cutting edge work here. Thank you. And we have a few technical questions, if I may. Um, so firstly, we're asked about the calculating a spectrogram, as you showed early in your presentation and specifically what parameters should be used. So parameters such as the sampling rate, frequency limits, windowing. Sorry, I was, can you repeat the question? I had trouble hearing some of that last bit. Can you hear me okay now? Yes, yes. Um, so how do we calculate or create the spectrogram? And in particular, for instance, is there a particular sampling rate or frequency limits or window duration that we should use? I haven't found typically that there's that this is an, a terribly sensitive area. So the sampling rate, of course, really depends on the, the system that you're using. And I personally don't usually resample the data because that can cause you know, issues with model performance. So it really would depend on the wearable device. Um, other parameters like hop length, um, typically, to be quite honest, the defaults for whatever package you're using are effective. The only reason you'd really want to customize them, at least in my experience, is if you wanted to make the data smaller. So if you wanted to, for example, extend the hop length or essentially the stride of the, the calculation so that the, the, the resolution was a little more coarse grained, you could reduce the dimensionality of your data. But typically, I mean, kind of the, the purpose of this work is to avoid having to take away more fine grained features and be able to instead improve the efficiency of our, of our models, if that makes sense. 
certainly does. Yeah, thank you. Um, then we have a question on dealing with baseline drift in long PPG recordings. And Haipeng asks, if it's excluded, will it affect the extremely low frequency components um, in long PPG signals? So I don't think that I don't, again, I don't usually include, um, I don't usually exclude the lower frequencies um, for that reason. Another, I guess, step that you can take to kind of understand um, baseline drift or, you know, areas more related to the respiratory rate is that you can extract the respiratory rate from the PPG signal itself. So with, with new deep learning techniques focused more specifically on this and respiratory quality indices, we can extract you know, the respiratory rate and use it as an accompaniment to the raw waveform rather than forcing the model to learn that implicitly, we can tell it in advance, which in some cases has been shown to improve performance. That's very interesting, the idea of combining this approach with um, older approaches as well. Absolutely. I mean, we want to be able to hold the machine's hand in any any possible way that we can, because ultimately, as interesting as some of these techniques might be, they're still not that intelligent. So if there's any way we can make it easier, that's certainly something we want to take advantage of. I have two quick further questions, if I may, just before we close. So firstly, um, we're asked, what are your suggestions on the choice of embeddings for the PPG as an input? to uh, the VIT. Um, so for instance, word to VEC or audio to VEC. Sure. Um, I believe with uh, the, the VIT, at least for Im images, at least, and we we've, haven't we've had any issues with PPG, that essentially when you use VIT, you're breaking that matrix down into essentially patches. And then a linear representation of those patches is learned over as part of the model. So it's not, obviously images aren't discrete like text where you can have a sequence of word IDs and corresponding embeddings. You instead have a more dynamic structure where you have you know, local neighborhoods that may contain relevant information. So what Vision Transformer does is that it breaks that matrix down into individual patches, learns a essentially learns a linear representation of the relationship between those patches, and then uses that for further modeling of the of the matrix. Thank you. That was very clear. So, final question um, from Dr. James May, and um, James says, "Thank you for your talk." You mentioned that large periods of PPG sequences can be fairly inactive and don't contain much useful information. And James wonders, how would this relate to the pulse rate variability work that ELISA is carrying out where actually low variability in pulse, sorry, low levels of pulse rate variability are in fact potentially telling us that there's a problem. So they may indicate the pathology. Well, in that case, that would be something I think that we haven't really studied in the context of, of AI is how to kind of leverage the, the lack of variability. Typically regions where there's no, there's no signal have, are, have traditionally been ignored. For example, you know, if we're trying to predict you know, the degeneration of a patient, you look for you know, significant events that happen that show a deviation from the baseline. But if in fact, the lack of variability is a signal that we would wanna capture, you know, we could integrate into the model some sort of metric or heuristic that represented that lack of variability similar to how we integrate the respiratory rate. So that could be of interest in future work to kind of understand if that indeed turns out to be the case, how we can use that alongside the models that we already have. Thank you, James. You've very clearly explained quite a complex and um, I imagine new topic to many of us. So thank you very much for giving us this introduction and we will look forward to seeing how your work progresses um, over the coming years. Thanks so much, Peter. May I extend my thanks um, to the other speakers as well, to Dr. James May and to Elysia Meher Meher. And, um, just to pass on details of future events. So um, today's webinar is part of a series on photoplephismography and I'll pop a link in the chat to um, give you uh, the link to where you can find out more. And there will be one further webinar in the series in September. Uh, so do keep an eye out for that. And so as well as thanking the speakers, I'd like to also thank the Institute of Physics and Engineering in Medicine for hosting today's webinar. 
and uh, to draw it to a close. Finally, thank you all for attending today. <laughs>